Well, thanks, Tav, and thanks to the rest of the staff here at the Bristol Bay Campus. For those of you that might not know, uh, across the university right now is a staff recognition and development day. And they decided to postpone their festivities for us here for this conference. Very nice to them. Um, so yeah, today um, I'll be talking about my proposed master's project. Um, I'm a new master's student that started in January. Uh, title of this presentation, Very High Resolution Mapping of Anadromous Streams and Salmon Habitat in the Chignik Watershed. Uh, and this project um, is getting support from one of my advisors is here today, Chris Mayo, as well as Matthew Balaj, who's back in Fairbanks. Um, and they're both with the Alaska Coastal Cooperative. And you can go ahead to the next slide. So a little bit of background. Um, the state of Alaska uh, has made a lot of improvements over the past couple of decades in terms of uh, high resolution geospatial data. But um, not to bring it down, uh, <laughs> in general, it's, it's, it's poor compared to a lot of the rest of the country. Um, and that's even more the case for remote communities in rural Alaska. Uh, a lot of those same communities rely on salmon for um, traditional food and resource gathering purposes. Um, and so in an effort to um, build resiliency and capacity for these communities um, in the with respect to climate change or other geomorphic changes that might be happening uh, in and around their communities, uh, then better geospatial uh, data can help with that. Next slide. So here's the, the Chignik watershed um, where I'll be conducting my project. Um, this is a pretty unique and dynamic watershed. Uh, it's located on the south, uh, the south shore of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, it's not a huge area, but uh, basically some of my labels disappeared, um, starting up at the, the headwaters of the Black Lake, um, which drains down into Chignik Lake, Chignik Lagoon, and then out into Chignik Bay. Uh, this is a, a pretty important area for all five species of Pacific salmon, but um, from a salmon habitat perspective, there's, there's a lot of uh, differences and the hydrography of, of the, the lakes and, and the system that, that make it really important for, for salmon productivity. Next slide. I think it's actually going to be the same information. So um, we'll go back actually one more. One, one thing I want to touch on with the with the map. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so up at the top, the zoom thing is kind of uh, obscuring our legend, but I, I want to make mention of the, the darker blue lines in this figure um, representing the uh, data that's available from uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Games Anadromous Waters Catalog. This is a repository of, of known salmon streams throughout the state of Alaska. Uh, and it's a pretty important uh, data set from the perspective of being able to offer some sort of legal protection to these streams. Um, however, uh, the Department of Fish and Game admits themselves that it likely represents a really small fraction of the total number of salmon streams that are that are important. Um, and so what I did here for this figure is also included data that was just uh, brought from um, USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service and all these folks that contributed uh, efforts to the National Hydrography data set. And you can see a lot more streamlines um, that may or may not be also critical for uh, salmon. So. Uh, now we can go to the, the research question slide. So, so yeah, that, that brings me to, to, to my research question, which is what is the spatial distribution and extent of salmon habitat uh, that's known in the Chignik watershed? Um, how can we assess and monitor change in these areas if we don't know all the streams that are important for salmon? And this is a, a situation that's not unique to the Chignik region. Um, it's all throughout Alaska and going back to the availability of high resolution geospatial data, um, there's plenty of other places where research has been done, but needs, needs more uh, effort from that. So um, I'll just really quickly jump through a couple concepts for those of you that might not be familiar with what a virtual watershed is. It's basically a, a, a digital model of all the water bodies, streams and rivers in a particular area. Um, why do we use virtual watersheds? Well, watersheds can be massive, right? And 
the feasibility um, of doing field surveys and walking through a, a watershed and expense and hazard and all, all these other reasons why we um, like to have a digital model that we can sit on our computers and look at instead to, to perform analyses or, or look at something like the salmon habitat. So um, next slide. How do we get a virtual watershed? Um, we rely on digital elevation models uh, or DEMs, um, and this provides the base topographic data um, from which we can delineate our watershed. Um, now there's all sorts of different kinds of digital elevation data that's available. Um, and here in this figure, I wanted to point out that uh, the, the one on the left clearly looks like it's a higher resolution. It's easier to make out the topography in this area versus um, what's all over the state right now, which is if our five meter resolution data. So um, from a preliminary uh, research standpoint, before we're actually headed into the field this summer, um, the IFSAR data is, is pretty much all we have to work with. But as I'll talk about going forward, there's some opportunities to, to improve upon that. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about our methods here. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on each of these icons. And, and I know generally we don't like to focus too heavily on methods for, uh, for science talks like this. but um, being that I haven't been out in the field yet, there's there's not a whole lot else for me to talk about. Um, and then in the center is an example from USGS of a digital topo bathymetric map. Um, it's probably unlikely within the scope of my master's project that we'll be able to capture the entire Chignik watershed. However, um, with help from our community partners, uh, the Chignik Intertribal Coalition, and uh, the Chignik Bay um, Tribal Council and, and specific local experts in those communities. We hope to identify some key salmon habitat within the watershed that we can uh, end up with a product like that for. So next slide. The first of those, LIDAR. So this uh, arrangements were made um, for a flight survey over several of the communities within the Chignik region uh, to conduct this LIDAR survey. Well, um, why is LIDAR important? Well, this is going to allow for us to basically get the best bare digital elevation model that money can buy. Um, so this is very, going back to the, the title of this uh, presentation, very high resolution. We're talking um, like meter to submeter uh, resolution. So um, there was some other funding that came into uh, the equation here, which allowed us to uh, essentially leverage um, the survey that was already taking place and cover a much larger area of the watershed that can be used uh, for our project and for other, other reasons going forward. Next slide. Um, another component of this is hydrographic data. So it can include a lot of things like bathymetry, for example, which is you know, the depth of the water, um, but also importantly, things like stream flow or discharge. Um, stream flow and discharge is, is one of many uh, considerations um, that can be used for whether or not salmon inhabit a particular stream or, or spawn or rear in a particular area. Um, so the hope is to deploy some sensors and some sites that have been identified by our, our local community partners uh, to collect some of this baseline uh, information. Next slide. Um, we're also going to be using uh, differential GPS. As Harper mentioned in her presentation, this is a high high precision, high accuracy um, survey tool, uh, and it's going to allow us to establish ground control points um, throughout our, our, our field survey areas. Um, it's also going to allow, hopefully, for us to collect bathymetric data where um, traditional sonar soundings aren't going to be feasible um, because the water is just, just too shallow. So next slide. Uh, another component, uh, again, relying on our, our local community partners in the, in the various communities throughout the, the Chignik region. Um, we're going to be actually contracting and paying uh, some local fish captains uh, to install the low ramps uh, fish finders that, that we'll be providing to them um, so they can go about their entire fishing season throughout the summer, which extends far beyond the amount of time that we'll be able to spend there and collect more bathymetric data for us. So this is a really important um, building block for developing that final product. Uh, and it'll allow us to, to capture a lot more 
information about the watershed uh, in the years to come. Next slide. Almost last piece of the of the puzzle here. Um, with some of the prior field work that's been done with the Alaska Coastal Cooperative and the Alaska Coastal Geoscience Lab. Um, there are some UAS surveys that were conducted. Uh, this is a 3D model of Chigney Bay. Uh, and so basically when we're out in the field this year, we're hoping to uh, go beyond just the communities over to those salmon habitat areas that have been identified and do, do similar work. So high resolution imagery for, for these areas to contribute to our final model and data sets. Slide. And then finally, um, this is the, the second part of my, my master's project that I'll be um, taking on more of the responsible <laughs> responsibility for independently. Um, we'll use geographic information systems to assemble all these different uh, data. Um, which is useful for visualization purposes for all different kinds of ecosystem modeling, uh, specifically salmon habitat, uh, and then just watershed analysis. So back to the original research question, uh, expected outcomes. Um, once we can create this uh, seamless uh, topobathic, topo, excuse me, topobathymetric model for uh, specific sites within our watershed, and we can have a higher resolution, more accurate delineation for the entire watershed. Uh, we'll be able to use research that's already been conducted by ADF and G, by uh, University of Washington FRI for uh, salmon specifically in the in the area, and use them as inputs in our in our final product. Um, and that should be it. Yeah, it's kind of a unique system. Uh, why do you keep this part there for the for the, the Chigneyk region? Yeah, yeah. So I it's been in development for a number of years before I started as a master's student. Um, there's already some some work that's been done out there. Um, but I actually I, I forgot to mention earlier on when I was introducing the watershed there was a a fisheries collapse uh, in 2018 and a, and a disaster a declaration issued for that area for salmon in particular. And so, uh, again, in an effort to help uh, build capacity and resiliency for those communities there, we wanted to be able to offer them more data. Yeah, and Chris can probably speak to more of that. If you want to <laughs> more. I had a question about the state of Alaska and their protection of salmon streams. Uh, currently, is it? Have to go up through the salmon habitats in order to get protection. And will your program actually be to the point where you can show salmon habitat for these tributaries? I think that's, yeah, that's sort of the, the overarching goal and hope. So we'll be able to deliver these data products to the community members themselves first, especially because they're essential to us being able to collect the data that we need. Um, and then that would hopefully arm them with, you know, the information that they could use to potentially seek out further protection. I mean, that's not the primary role of the, the lab and, and everything, but yeah, we definitely want to offer as much support as possible to the students. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Henry Lillian, born and raised in Dillon Island. Welcome to my home lab. I'm here on traditional Olympic land. And I welcome you. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> so, I started back in 2008. I gained a, a little tiny piece of land down at Coffee Point from my grandfather. And it Set into my heart and mind uh, a desire to develop my land. And over the years, it grew into a passion for renewable energy. And my passion for renewable energy started as a get rich quick scheme, like this fantasy of just 
you know, this wind farm and all the money coming to me. And then you know, over the years, education kind of graduated me from this self-serving, self-enclosed thing into this uh, bigger thing that resulted in a coffee plant wind. And it's, uh, it would be, it's a concept, it's a concept, so it's a conglomeration of three tribal corporations, Chagyang Limited, which is Chilean, our tribal corporation, our tribal corporation, and Sogoyuk Inc., which is Sogoyuk, means joining the river or something like that, and it's a Yupik, and a Manicotic Natives Limited, and they are 10 miles west of us. So it would be a conglomerative effort of three tribal corporations, and it would be 100% tribal, tribally owned, and it would serve Dillingham and Manicotic and Alec and Yupik. So the next slide. So here we are way up here, and the proposal is to start a wind farm on this land here, which is Chogyang Limited Land, Tribal Corporation. So what we do is we develop a wind farm here, integrate it onto Dillingham's grid. And uh, so our grid right now is 100% diesel. We are supplied with three and a half million dollars average diesel per year. And so we would integrate renewable energy onto the grid and introduce it. And then we would move south. And all of this land here belongs to Clark's Point Tribal Corporation. And they would then develop renewable energy projects, wind, solar. It's their prerogative. And then we'd get to the mouth of Snake River here. And Chug Young Limited owns that land right there. They would and develop a wind farm there and build a boat landing for commuters to travel to Clark's Point, Ecock, and Manicotic's Erie River, River Access Road. They could take a boat and come float down and then drive to Dillingham. And it would save all tribal people a lot of gas and provide safety measures as well as, you know, just a better, beautiful route and open up our land. So on the other side here, this is Manicotic Native Limited Land, and we would develop another wind farm there for them. That, you know, obviously, respectively, all the generated income would go to respective tribal members. Next slide. <clears throat> so the sun in the sky provides enough energy in uh, 24 hours that would. Uh, let's say free fusion reactor in the sky convenient converts 4 million tons of mass into energy every second, producing a catch an extremely tiny amount of it for all civilization. And now, the sun is a form of, a, well, the wind is a form of solar energy because you know, the sun heats up the earth and then the heat air rises and cool air pushes into the void, and there's differences in air densities. And so that's a, a solar energy. And, so all we know that renewable energy is getting more and more efficient every year and it's getting cheaper and cheaper to develop. And so next slide. So coffee point wind would be a eight to 12 megawatt wind farm or, or hybrid solar wind, depending on the prerogative of each tribal corporation and what is working best for our grid. Um, we've done studies back in 2004 and five, as you see here, and we erected a um, meteorological tower over there at Kanakanak. We found a class three, which is an average 12 mile an hour wind speed. And uh, Fire Island wind in Anchorage, that's also a class three. They have 11 1.6 megawatt GEs. They got the infrastructure and they're developing renewable energy and, and delivering onto the rail belt, which stretches from Fairbanks all the way down to Homer and everywhere in between. We got a bunch of utilities pumping energy onto the grid without of natural gas. But they're able to power 4,000 homes with that single wind farm. And uh, that's more than a population going out. So what could we do with the uh, eight megawatt wind farm operating? And this capacity factor here is interesting. Typically wind farms in Alaska operate at 30, percent capacity factor it means if you have a tempered 10 megawatt wind farm it's going to operate on average 30 percent of 10 megawatts, three megawatts being delivered onto the grid on average 
Um, so that, that's actually a picture I took flying here from, from Aikens to doing it of Fire Island wind. <clears throat> so next slide. So this wind farm will only be successful if we uh, have the proper integration system. The integration system take the renewable energy off the turbine and deliver it onto the grid of Dillingham, which is the electrical system that delivers electricity to all, to all the homes and businesses. And so the way we do that, so wind is very fluctuations and it's very capricious. One day we might have blasts and winds at 50 miles an hour and the next day we'll be completely calm. So the way we deliver a stable load is through dump loads, uh, uh, such as a battery, a flywheel, and thermal loads. What do you have electric? And a good example of a dump load, they have a battery bank and they have a flywheel. But they also have hydro. Next slide. So a battery bank, here's an example of a battery bank. It's a 1.9 megawatt to a 3.9 megawatt, delivering 3.9 megawatt hours. And uh, Tesla, Tesla developed this battery bank and it's a modularized one. So you could scale it bigger and smaller. And they actually have the option here where you can click yes and have them deliver it and actually install it for you and integrate onto the grid for you. And they do everything from the foundation to the delivery and integration. So, and that that is like seven hundred thousand dollars for that option, though. But if you choose, you could just get it. And the price goes down significantly. Um, so, uh, next slide. So, a thermal load is just another dump load. And dump loads, like I said, are ways to take the fluctuations of wind and convert that into either electricity that you store in batteries or you could store it in heat. You generate heat. So it's really windy. All the electricity in Dillingham is uh, covered by the wind. Um, you're able to take access electricity from the wind and store it in the batteries. If the batteries are full, then you could put it in a thermal load, which could then heat homes and businesses. Or you could sort in a thermal load that can generate steam. And you take that steam and you, you could, the wind dies down, you could generate electricity with the steam. And um, <clears throat> next slide. So if you could press play on this, this is a video I went to my, Little piece of land at Coffee Point, which is seven miles past Kanaknak. Play like 30 seconds of it because it's like a minute long. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's the land there. And the study was done at Kanaknak back in 2004 when Chubby Young wanted to develop the renewable energy project and just didn't go through with it. Technology wasn't right, the, the financing wasn't right, for whatever reason. It, but now I think uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, all these federal incentives and state, state incentives that has made the time right for tribes to move forward with renewable energy projects. Yeah, so this is a coffee point. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's really windy there. Right across the bay, there's Clark's Point. There's only one little misshapen, misshapen spruce tree that speaks to the, <laughs> the wind. It's very consistent wind there. There's a mud flat there. So if any commuters from Clark's Point or Ecock are gonna have to wait for high tide to get into the, the mouth of Snake River. <clears throat> and that way is Dillingham. There's a valley down here. It's just a gorgeous valley. And that, that's another reason to develop wind there is because uh, valleys have a, a, a pressure difference in air densities. Because those valleys are cool. The next slide. <laughs> so like I said, it would be a, it can be broken down into four phases. Phase one is developed with uh, Chugyung Limited. Um, 
Chugyang with the former conglomerate corporation with Flex Point Tribes, Sagoya Incorporated, and Manicor Natives Limited. So the three federal corporations that would have to form one corporation. And they would start with Chugland developing a wind farm there. And like I said, move moving south with Savoya and um, developing the, the road to the launch at the Mazda Snake River. And then eventually we would uh, run a alliance to Manicota, which is a great inner tie. And there are tons of federal funding for that. And that would offer Manicota a lower and stabilized as well. A better route for commuting. And um, next slide. So, power purchase agreement is uh, something that the corporation would have to negotiate with Nishigat Cooperative. Nishigat Cooperative is not a corporation. We have a great tie with the electric grid. So, we fly a 20 mile line to the electric grid and they get. <clears throat> So we would have to negotiate terms with Nishigat Cooperative. They would be able to buy electricity from the wind farm. And when they spend money on electricity generators from their property, they would be eligible for our cost equalization subsidy, state subsidy for renewal. You know, Rural Alaska. And so when people in Dillingham and Manicota feel like they can buy and pay their electrical bills, they're basically paying themselves. Kind of keep some money in a in a region. And next slide. So um, financing is uh, it's insane right now. I'm going to start convulsing. There's so much money for renewable energy right now um, with this administration and with this time. It's, it's urgent that we, you know, we have the capability, we have the education, we have the capacity, we have the will. It's really up to, really up to us to to reach out and, and, and take the money. So it really boils down to uh, the tribal corporation. Chugyam Limited, Tsugurak, and Manakotak to reach out for this. Um, if you go to any one of these, talk to them. They're going to say, how can we help you? We want to help you. We're going to help you with the business plan. We're going to help you with the business model. We're going to work with you. All we have to do is be open and accept the help. They have technical assistance for every step of the way from Feasibility studies, the bird studies, the land studies, the geothermal studies, geotechnical studies, and erecting met towers, measuring wind speed, direction, velocity, temperature, everything they will help. So time is right, right? Billions of dollars for renewable energy, renewable energy for Indian country right now. And next slide. So our outreach um, would be for tribal corporations, reaching down to their shareholders, their tribal members, and it provides an education opportunity for our tribal members to become trained in electrical engineering, civil engineering, uh, power technicians. Uh, we could mail out three by fives to our tribal members, have community meetings, do radio, newspaper, <clears throat> open house, the stakeholders. We educate the community. We have this opportunity, tremendous opportunity to do all this wonderful stuff. So next slide. So this would be uh, the grid tie from Dillingham down the coffee point. And here's the, would be the landing for the boats and stuff. And we'd have a grid tie to Manicorp. See their airstrip over here. Um, so that'd be a 15 mile grid tie transmission line. And um, there is financing for that. For the, for that. Mm -hmm. the next slide. Uh, what does it mean? It means tribal sovereignty. It means that we're not buying electricity. We're not buying oil to ship it in our waters, to store it in our tanks, to pipe it to our utility, to burn it in, in our air, land, and water. It means that we are 
exercising our tribal rights and, and developing our own land on our own. <clears throat> and uh, there's potential to lower and stabilize the cost of electricity, reduce our reliance on fog, foreign oil, like this war in Russia shot our diesel prices up, like you all know about it, and uh, career opportunities. I know one of my good friends is a tower technician, but he can't live here. He's got a home here and his family's here, but he's traveling around the world and around the state of Alaska, working on towers all over the state of Alaska. And he's kind of a great guy. So this would give him you know, a chance to stay home in his homeland and maintain our towers and shave off five miles when you're going from Clark's Point to Dillon now for the tribal members. We would open land. We could drive down that road, take berries. The several members from Clark's Point, they could develop housing or community building, or whatever is feasible. Um, <clears throat> be locally tribal owned, save power, like clean our air, land, and water. Uh, next slide. Oh, that's uh, that's the end of it. So, question. <laughs> Overall, how much would the entire project cost? Well, $55 million. And that's including the road, the transmission lines, the towers, turbines. Yeah. Yeah. A great, great presentation. I can tell something you're passionate about. Yeah. It's a, it's a great nice job. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Uh, my name is Katie DeMichael. I'm a master's student at UAA in uh, geospatial data science, and I'm working on a project called Firewall, which is a really long acronym for Foundations for Improving Resilience in the Energy Sector Against Wildfires on Alaskan Lands. It's a NSF-funded project um, under the Navigating the New Arctic, and it's a collaboration between UAA, UAF, George Washington University and Washington State University. So a lot of hands. Um, so I'm going to start with giving an overview of the, the problem that we're seeing and then give you a little background on the project and where we're at right now. So wildfire is becoming more and more prevalent in our lives with climate change. Um, the boreal forest is prone to wildfires and adapted to it. And it gives us this like really beautiful mosaic of new and old growth all across the state. But this is changing with climate change. Um, and we can't really rely on fire, fire data from the past to predict what's going to happen as um, things become more extreme. And um, our built communities aren't resistant like the forest is. So we need to be able to adapt to grow fires becoming larger and encroaching on our space. Slide. Um, the electricity grid in Alaska is pretty unique in that it's kind of a patchwork of microgrids. And microgrids are just really small electrical systems um, that are specific to small areas and they're not really connected to anything else. So as we just spoke, spoke about or learned about, um, they're really great for using renewable energy, but it means that we don't um, have all the resources that you might in the lower 48. So if wildfire disrupts a tower power line or we need to shut it down to make repairs, then we can't just redirect power from a neighboring community. Um, and that can be really destructive when we're depending on that. And that's even true for um, the rail belt, which is this picture up here where most of our power comes from. That's where the population center is. Um, it's just not connected to anything else. 
So the next slide. Um, and power is a public good. So any sort of outage is going to affect the community to some degree. Um, this is a screenshot of um, the Department of Health. Puts out numbers for how many people that are Medicare beneficiaries are dependent on electricity dependent um, medical devices. So we do have, we're looking into, um, the, or those are the people that are really affected by a contract. They're dependent on um, electricity to stay alive or to have assistance in their life. So when we lose power and we can't redirect power from somewhere else, what do we do? Um, and so that's kind of the major, the major question. And when it comes to wildfire, there's like so many layers that we need to take into consideration and think about. So um, we're hoping to make a platform where we can take that all into account. So the firewall project started in 2020, just as a, um, in a proposal period, we we're just starting to gain knowledge and um, generate knowledge about wildfires and electricity grid, and then moving into um, a second phase where we're trying to find some research directions and some roadmaps to figure out where we can go with this and bring everything together. Next slide. And after this first period, we held a workshop in 2021. Um, it is, you can watch it online and there's also a report on it. And it consisted of three sessions. The first one was about the natural environment, the second about the built environment, and the third about the social system. So those are kind of the big, the big um, three research areas that we pinpointed and started to talk about. Um, and there's a lot of, I think there's a hundred people at it um, and kind of like from academia, from utility companies, um, politicians, just people from all over Alaska came to talk about wildfire and what we can do. So next slide. We had some pretty big takeaways from the workshop and that's what fueled um, the, worst, the research that we're moving on with now. So first, we need more FireWise communities in Alaska. So FireWise communities are areas where people are using preventative measures around their homes and their communities prevent um, destructive wildfires from taking out um, their livelihood. We need a coordinated approach to power line right of way clearing and fuel break practices. So there's a lot of, there was a lot of discussion in this workshop about um, the right of way around our power lines and how we can prevent ignition. And then also what do we do if there is a wildfire in those areas? And this seems to be a, um, a problem that kind of seems to happen everywhere, like in California and stuff, there's a lot of talk about, about right-of-way clearing and how we can prevent wildfires. But in Alaska, some of those areas are so remote and our transmission plan goes really far. So that can be really unique. Um, and wildfires and electricity outages, um, it's not just about turning on the lights. It can also disrupt our water and our communications and our transportation, especially in more remote communities. And there are some pretty large gaps in the management for outages, um, especially for people that are dependent on medical equipment to some degree. And then finally, um, but certainly not least, we need to take into account um, information from indigenous peoples who have been practicing stewardship and cultural burning for thousands of years. Um, they need to be included in both our are planning and have a seat at the table as far as planning. Next slide. This is kind of a nice graphic of um, this project moving from a planning stage and then being broken down to what are all, what are all the topics that we can think about. Um, all these like agencies and utility companies um, that were consulted. And then eventually getting to coming to nine research questions and moving into research and going from two universities to four. Um, and then the next slide um, just breaks us down in a different way. I think with, because fire is so complex and we're looking at it from so many different angles, these are helpful in trying to um, kind of 
look at all the areas that we need to think about and consider. It really takes takes a lot to bring this all together. Next slide. These are on the website if you'd like to look at them closely. So we ended up with nine research questions, three in each of those um, three large categories. The first is our natural environment. So the goal is to generate some fuel maps and GIS for new products that can be shared and um, used by not just scientists, but the public and people fighting fires just like all across the board. Um, for the sake of time, I won't read, just read these questions to you. <laughs> um, but we wanna know what's the spatial, spatial distribution of fire prone wild fuel, wildfire fuel. So where can we evaluate where the long, largest risks is? Um, and can we keep these maps up to date in uh, with real time weather? Next slide. Um, we're also looking at our built environment. So we're kind of trying to, so this is mostly talking about power line and the electrical system. So we wanna be able to plan for before ignition happens, but also prevent it. But if it does happen, how do we mitigate the situation? Um, so looking into long-term planning and building um, and what is the future. Next slide. And then lastly, the social environment. Um, we need to know what, what will be most, most useful to people. Where are the vulnerabilities in our communities? Um, what, can we, what can we do to help um, inform people and keep everybody connected? Um, and how can we build a platform that's collaborative um, for everybody to be able to make decisions together among all the stakeholders? So our envisioned outcome is some sort of interactive platform um, for informed and coordinated decision making. So there's so much going on here. How can we bring it all together and um, look at it from all the different angles? And it's really important to remember that wildfire and all these elements are constantly changing. So whatever this platform ends up looking like, it needs to be able to adapt and move along with um, everything that could potentially change and unfold. So next slide. And teamwork is a really big part of this that takes um, a lot of expertise in different areas to come together and bring these things together. We need to have an understanding of the natural environment, the built environment and the social environment, and of course. So yeah, okay. Um, currently, we're just in, we've got funding to re start research in the fall. So, and the team does span a pretty large area, so I can't tell you what every person is doing, but mostly we're working on collecting data, finding sources. We're also preparing to collect some of our own data. Um, me, personally, I'm working on um, evaluating risk around along right-of-ways of, -ways of uh, transmission lines across the state. So that's what some of these photos are from some things that I, I found, but um, I just started in January, so I'm not terribly far. Okay, next slide. Um, we do have a website. Easiest way to find it is to Google Firewall UAA. Um, you can watch the workshop or just parts of the workshop. Um, and there is talk of another workshop in 2023 or 2024. Um, so yeah, keep, keep a lookout for that. And I think the next one's my last slide. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm not sure if I'm the only one. It's a little stuffy in here, and it does smell like cabbage soup. So if anybody would care. If I prop this door, is that okay with everyone? Okay, all right. Yeah, I got a female sign now over here. Yes. This is what I'm good there. Nice. Nice thing to have room for. Oh, yeah. 
We appreciate it, yeah. I made it as possible. Oh, there we go. Hey, there we go. It's good to me. Sweet. Well, hello, everybody. I want to thank the whole crew that put this here together and Eric uh, for having us all here. And we all made it, which is kind of awesome. There's a point where I was worried we wouldn't make it. We all made it. So this is great. Uh, I love hearing everybody's. I wish I could be both rooms at once because I love hearing what everybody's working on and how I can connect that to what we're doing over at T3, which stands for Teacher Technology. Uh, yeah, you can hit that next one. So a little bit about myself. I actually grew up in Wyoming and then moved up here uh, in Alaska in 2018. Uh, I am the UAF Makerspace Manager. So basically I hold a space for students, UAE students, faculty and staff to come in and do space up. Uh, with that, I oversee through T3 all of our makerspaces that we have in other sites, which I didn't make a slide for because of time. Uh, so I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, my interests are kind of in tech, agriculture and energy. So next time. So T three, our whole goal is basically just to inspire students to go forth and make differences in their communities. Whether that's they stay in their community or go to college, go to post secondary education, uh, that's kind of up to them. But our goal is to inspire them and motivate them and let them give them the tools and ability to actually create an impact on those that they care around them. So we are actually partnered with Upper Bound uh, UAF. That's kind of our base that we work with. So most of our students that we work with are upper bound students. And then Educating for Leadership is a nonprofit that we work through to kind of just smooth out things because the bureaucracy within the UAS system kind of makes slow happenings uh, when we want to go faster than that. So we work with a nonprofit to help us out on that aspect. Uh, but together, we all work with T3 Teaching Through Technology. Next one. So we serve. 15 right now we're adding one we're adding like three next year uh but these are all of the places that we serve within alaska here so we have a lot of rural communities in western alaska we have some in kind of south central and then a lot in southeast alaska that we serve so within those communities we do a lot of different events and we have a wide range of students that we serve some are very low gpa students uh, they don't perform a lot academically, but we also have some students in our program that do perform high academically. So we have a wide range of students that we serve and making sure that everyone is involved uh, in our programming. Next one. Well, there's fancy animations. I didn't know that. I'll pretend I knew that. Um, so this is kind of the pipeline our process goes through. So we have those sites uh, that you saw on the map before where we have a school administrator that is happy to work with us. This is typically the hardest point to get in sometimes with some school districts. Uh, we have an educator that we pay half time for uh, that is there to work with our students as well. And then, of course, we have our students, our learners that are there. We go through problem-based learning, growth mindset, community engagement, and an out. At the end of the pipeline, we have our T3 communities. These were, we have students working with community members. Our students are kind of innovators within the community, and they're also helping solve problems uh, more than just what's in a textbook and working to solve problems within the community itself. Next one. So this is kind of our philosophy on how we end up actually getting students to that point. We serve high school students, so from grade when they're coming into freshman year of high school, we kind of start them through this process and then throughout the entirety of high school and into college, uh, we kind of get them all the way to that community engagement point, but we kind of touch on everything in the first year later. So next one. Uh, 
I'll touch on growth mindset. Uh, growth mindset is basically a philosophy that you can take a failure and turn it into a learning opportunity, and you're not afraid to try new things. So this is what we really touch on when we first have our students, and then it's something that you can continually work on uh, throughout, not only when they're with us, but also throughout life. Uh, next one. Part of this is basically from our standpoint is building safe learning environments for our students to have that type of mindset. So practicing growth mindset ourselves as educators, um, but also kind of modeling that for those students and kind of that reflective space for students can they can reflect upon those points where they did have those failures or those awesome moments where they had a light bulb moment, they were able to solve something. Uh, so making that safe learning environment is super important to us. Next one. The technology skills is where that's where most of my actual skills are. Uh, so what I actually do a lot is teach students uh, tech. We do a lot of computer hardware, hardware and software. Uh, we have a lot of students that love to do programming. So we do a lot of that. Uh, building techniques, whether that's with uh, 3D printing, laser cutting, uh, using all kinds of stuff, carpentry, that type of stuff. And then going through those tools and processes to get those students to a point of self-confidence to where they can just take a machine and run with it and solve whatever problem they can see, how they can solve problems using these technology skills. Next one. So this kind of goes into our problem-based learning. We do have curriculum, we do have courses, but that we don't do the typical, it's in the textbook, do it. Uh, problem-based learning is student-led. So the students, they have the basic skills and then they take a question, a problem, whatever they see, and they just kind of run with it. And us as educators, uh, we kind of just kind of help them along the way. We're not always experts in what they're talking about, so we connect them with community members, uh, which is kind of why I'm here to connect with you all, uh, because we have a lot of students that are definitely interested in the topics you guys are working on. And that teamwork is huge. We're having our students work with each other, work with other people they don't know. Uh, we have students that have made connections all the way to Puerto Rico. Um, and so making those connections for students is huge, and building that teamwork capabilities with our students is kind of more of a big part there. Next one. And in order to kind of give the students that like, yes, I did it point, but also eventually you have credit for working on that. Uh, we created this badging system, which is just a micro credential for these students that they have hit, they have shown a skill competency. They don't have to take a test, they have to show they can do something. Um, and so we have basically these topic trends, whether it's 3D printings, working with raspberry pies, and three badges at three levels. So you start with your basics, intermediate, and then your advanced, um, and work through that as well. And I think, or no, that I'll touch on that later, it's all of our different courses. So those badges, students can build them up. And then we actually use these guys to decide what students get to go on, like what trips. So if we have a trip where we need students that know have to have some type of environmental monitoring skills to really gain as much as they possibly can on a trip, we'll use these to kind of decide uh, out of those applicants to who ends up going. And eventually you have credit, because they stack these. So the most important part about this, it's great, we have growth mindset, we have technology skills, but we need to have that community engagement. Now, this is not only engagement of our students, engaging the community, but also community engaging our students, uh, which is a lot of what we work on. So working with those communication skills, empathizing, listening, um, not talking over others, and also sharing your solutions, that storytelling aspect. It's cool if you did something, but if you don't tell anybody, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, next one. And then, in the end, our whole goal is we get some students that are engaged and they can actually have an agency solve problems themselves and ultimately reach self-actualization um, and actually just start talking to people and asking more questions and being confident in themselves to be able to solve problems. Next one. So we have our philosophy. We have our type line. What does this actually look in action? Next one. So we have a five-week summer program that we will work with our upper bound students and some of our T3 students, where we take them in this five-week immersive course, where this year we're actually starting in Anchorage, we're doing our basics, and then we're splitting up to Valdez, Cordova, Denali, oh wow, what's the other one, Kotzebue, and there's one more, Juno, um, on five different trips where they're going to gather data and they're going to come back to UAF for three weeks and kind of finalize their problems and come up with their solutions. So this is one of those moments where you can really impact students' life in a positive way. Um, and it can take that back to their communities and help out their peers and the community itself. We also do a lot more of these steam fests because it doesn't take as much planning, logistics, and money, uh, where we will actually go to each community and basically put on a three-day three event where we're really focusing on those technology skills that those students can then work on throughout the school year, actually throughout the entire year, and kind of give them the tools to tackle those 
So these are our PBL courses uh, right here. A majority of them, I mean, we're teaching through technology, so they're all tech-based. Uh, but we also kind of want to work on one we've been developing that I'll touch on in a bit is our energy curriculum, um, which is something we actually piloted, I think, what, February? Uh, so that's an interesting one we'll touch on as well. Next one. Oh, actually, go back. So if you guys do want to use these courses, use them. We have all of them up at North and Alaska as well. Um, and so these, we have been working with eCampus to get them up. And I think we have six up right now. Uh, in the next year, we're hoping to have 30. Up. So all those courses are available for use. Just log in Canvas and ta-da. Um, they're there. So if you guys want to go for it, go for it. Next one. Thank you. <laughs> so part of this is having that student leadership ability right there. So we're having different clubs based upon interests that students um, have. And so we have our five clubs here and we're honestly con constantly expanding it. And these are where we partner specifically with organizations. So our seismology club is partnered with the Alaska Earthquake Center. Our drones, uh, we're actually partnering right now with the FAA uh, to get students their part 107 license. Uh, energy is with ASEP, storytelling. We actually don't have a partner for that yet, so we're working on that. And then we take over the leadership part. Um, so these four clubs is where, instead of just working with students within their community, they're actually on Zoom meetings um, and going to specific events specifically for these with students from around Alaska and around the nation. Next one. So uh, this is where I want to talk more about the energy curriculum itself. Um, that we're piloting. So we focus on energy systems, working with students to get that base understanding of what those are, and then looking at these efficiency models, um, whether it's in their household, whether it's community. Uh, this microgrid actually right here is one that a student actually drew in Acceledra. Um, and so getting that base knowledge to where they can actually identify the problems and improve either with some power strips in their household, or if they're going to work with their local uh, utility uh, to actually start helping with a little bit more efficiency. And then technical skills, uh, using flare cameras, using multimeters, that type of thing, uh, to be able to actually go out and do some really cool stuff, which is the next slide. We actually took students and we did an energy on a, the Orth Lodge down in Juneau. Um, actually, Cordova, sorry, that was in Cordova. And so we took this group of students and they spent three days, they, didn't throw, they did an entire energy audit um, electrical and also a thermal energy audit on the asset block. It was, it was awesome to see these students do this um, because they had all those base things that they gave from our curriculum and then going out and actually applying it. They had a lot of those light bulb moments, which is awesome to see. Um, and there's actually a video, I don't have it up, of uh, the students made our storytelling crew made about what they did there. And it's actually a really awesome video. Um, but realistically, we want to keep piloting a lot more of these energy audits as we go forward. So we're looking to do energy audits. I know we're looking to do one here. We're looking to do one in basically every single community we have uh, to get this out there for the students and get them used to actually using these tools and then giving that information to a bunch of folks. Uh, the Orca Lodge, they actually were looking at if it would cost less to do a heat pump versus running diesel generators. So we had actually had students that went through and they did all the calculations. It was crazy. Um, they found out saving thirty thousand dollars a year if they used a heat pump for their main source of heat versus uh, diesel generators. So that was that was the awesome part as well. Uh, yeah. So next one. That's kind of the end of what I have here. Uh, if we had Wi-Fi right now, you guys could do all these. Uh, but we do have our teacher website, a little bit more in-depth knowledge on what we do. There's definitely components I left out because of time. Um, the UAF major space, which is just a whole another NCUT3, and then our UAF Canvas courses are right there as well. Um, and then my contact. Is yeah. Can you take courses through the makerspace? program if you're like, you teach people how to use the 3D printer? Yeah, so the part that makes the makerspace work, it's for the other space with a bunch of tech in it. Uh, but we I have six lab technicians right now, and you walk in and tell them what you want to work on, and they train you um, on how to work on it. So not only can you go through those courses, but you can actually, like in our makerspace specifically, because it's open to everybody, you can walk in, and we have techs that will train you on how to use the equipment. Um, and also, they do a lot of projects management as well. And so if you have a project, you're kind of stonewalled on something, they can help you find the right connections to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. What 
So this is currently just UAF. We do have our UA upper bound and ANSA. Uh, we're working on partnering with them. We've gotten to the point where we're actually self-sustained to this point. Um, this has been a building over the last three years. Uh, so we're working on partnering with them right now. Uh, that's in conversation. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm thinking about your talk versus some of the earlier talks, and I'm wondering whether you envision um, the possibility of helping students to build all sorts of environmental sensors. Indeed, we do have a whole curriculum this summer that we're actually running over. Actually, the whole point of the summer program is environmental monitoring. Uh, so we use Raspberry Pis as our main base, and then we're actually, I think we're doing some purple installing some purple air sensors. I was just going to ask about purple air. Yeah, yeah, so we're installing those in all of our target communities that we're targeting this summer. So yeah, and then teach students how to um, do data analysis and what to do with that data and what it actually means. Uh, so yeah, we're working on building that out as well. And are you thinking about maybe a badge in data biz as well? Okay. Yeah, we have, we only have those six strands up right now, but we have plans for 15 different strands and 15 different topics for three different badges piece. So yeah, building. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Meg Waite, and I'm here to do more of like a storytelling session with you all on a project I was part of, and actually, I learned about this project at the Hate Free Makerspace. Um, I had taken a class there in 2021, and some students came up to me one day and said, hey, you want to join the Solar Decathlon? And I go, what the heck is that? And I'm actually a student in the Sustainable, sustainable Energy Program uh, through Bristol Bay, and I found out that this was actually a class being offered. So the US Department of Energy since 02 has done something called Race to Zero. And, or sorry, no, that is actually the design challenge. So what I'm about to talk about is something that's broken up into two tracks. The build challenge um, started in 2002. And then the design challenge, which used to be called Race to Zero started in 2019. And um, basically, this is a, a way for students to get real world experience in project design and development. So um, through our class, we went ahead and partnered with uh, a tribal community called the Village of Solomon, based out of Nome, Alaska. And we were helping them address uh, a couple of things. They have a tribal agreement to go ahead and be in alignment with the Paris Accord and try to get our emissions down. Um, the next thing was to address carbon uh, shortages. So the village of Solomon, um, and next slide, please. Um, the village of Solomon is um, a community that's actually 35 miles outside of Nome. And they shut down in the 60s um, because of their school shutting down. Sorry. So they, they've just been displaced since then, and most of them live in Nome. And so our professor, next slide. <laughs> Our professor, Mark Mastiller, went to Deila Johnson, and she's on the far right here. Um, she's the environmental coordinator for her tribe, and she used to be a student through Bis Bristol Bay. And um, Mark said, hey, we are thinking of trying out for Solar Decathlon this year. Can we help your community at all? Is this something? Because Mark knew that Deila um, really cares about sustainable energy and also um, addressing the needs of her community. So this was a way for us to get real, real design thinking and um, also do some project work. And when I say project work, this was all remote. So we actually never met um, in person during this, during this class. Um, uh, myself and my other colleague, Ives, who's in the middle in the, in the dark black shirt, uh, we're based in Fairbanks. And then in the middle in the blue blouse is Amanda Tordal. And Amanda works for Coeric and was living in Nome, but moved during the course of this challenge to Illinois with her family, um, including her husband and her two twin kids. And what I want to say about this group of people right here is you're looking at 
people who care about community, but also care about elders and children. So you have three parents and one, and one dog mom. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we really wanted to do something for the community that focused on the needs of rural Alaska. Next slide, please. Um, so again, this is the village of Solomon here. And this was a photo courtesy of tribal members. So a lot of this information that I'm gonna share today um, is representative of a large group of people that came together to support this project. And unfortunately, I was the only one who could make it. So thank you for letting me share today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so basically the tribe uh, was able to get funding and purchased uh, some property in Nome. Um, and so this was just, again, a project to design a home and, and look at like, what would the cost be if we implemented renewable energy, but also focus on passive house design. Um, and so a couple of things here, and I did bring my phone. I wanted you guys to be my accountability buddies today and I'm trying to just not use my phone, but there's a lot of lingo in here that was new to me um, as an undergraduate student. And I actually study the intersection of biology and design. Uh, so this was just a way for me to really work with an, an interdisciplinary team of people um, and really learn more about um, housing and uh, what what that would look like for a place like Nome, where it has really high winds and is very cold and um, has frequent power outages as a result of that. So next slide, please. Um, and so when we're talking about a decathlon, what exactly does it mean to be doing a decathlon competition? Um, I'm not going to read through all of the details of what the, what the requirements were, but um, the 10 things that we had to focus on were the architecture, the engineering, market analysis, embodied environmental impact, durability and resilience, integrated performance, energy performance, occupant experience, comfort and environmental quality, and also the presentation that we had to do um, both in the semifinals and when we made it to finals. So that being said, we did have a team of 13, but as the semester progressed, people started to see, wow, this is a lot of work. And if you're a student, whether you're a grad student or you're just a full-time graduate student or you're a parent going to school, which is a lot of us, um, this is a lot of work. And so the fact that people stuck it out uh, was huge because in order to participate, you actually have to have at least three people on the team. And um, thankfully we, we were able to maintain that number and gain an additional team member um, into the spring semester. So uh, our design goals, uh, we focused on a couple of things. We focused on creating something that would be multi-generational, again, age of place, uh, looking at how can we design a dwelling you know, to fit the needs of people with physical or other disabilities, looking at um, you know, what, is, what is the climate like? What, is the, what are the cultural values of the place where we're trying to build? Um, and also looking at the energy efficiency uh, we had to look at <laughs> the cost of heating fuel. I mean, three hundred to four hundred dollars per month in Nome. How can we? How can we help? Um, given that, again, the cost of renewables is getting more affordable every year. But what can we do in the meantime um, to develop a blueprint that this community or other communities could take forward? Um, emergency secure. Uh, you know, how can we address? How many, how many days or how many hours a building has before it freezes, right? That's another thing too. Um, in the state of Alaska, we don't have any energy efficiency standards um, as far as buildings goes. Uh, myself, I'm actually a, a student volunteer with the Pacific region of the US Green Building Council at the moment, and we're trying to get an Alaska, Alaska chapter started up again, um, maybe an opportunity for emerging professionals to get more involved in their municipalities, their boroughs, and look at um, what are the needs for that area and how can we start implementing things that make sense for people where, where they're located without um, saying this is the standard because it might not work for the whole state um, overall. And then repli replicable. So again, looking at the market analysis, um, what is it going to cost and what materials do we need to not only build this thing, but how do we get all of that to know? So next slide, please. Um, so as we went through uh, our different charrettes, this is again focused more on design thinking. And 
I just want to say none of us have a background in engineering. Um, some of us worked with energy and project planning, um, but ultimately this was totally new to us. And that is something that so the Solar Decathlon really tries to emphasize on is having multidisciplinary teams come together. Granted, when we actually got to the competition, we started seeing graduate programs that were focused on architecture and engineering. So we were kind of underdogs <laughs> in a way. Um, next slide, please. Um, but that being said, you know, we were really committed to helping out uh, DIY's community. That was the goal. So again, thinking about the makerspace and how, you know, what can you learn from an experience or how can you grow forward? We don't know how to do this yet. That's kind of something that I learned um, in my time at the makerspace. And uh, we have some really great photos here provided by Diyla. This is actually her uh, picking berries in Nome, and this is another community member. And we just kind of really wanted to show, you know, who is this for? And you know, especially after the pandemic, I think a lot of us were starting to think, how can we design buildings um, to be safe for people in the event of um, an unprecedented like global <laughs> pandemic. Uh, so again, we focused on a couple of things. We wanted a, a, a master bedroom on the bottom floor um, with a bathroom as well. So that could be accessible to folks who um, were either elderly or couldn't go up and down stairs, for example. Um, and we also focused on having an open concept. So as you can tell, these are, these are moms. These are parents that really want functional spaces in their household and safe spaces. That was really important um, to the design process. And especially in the event of a power outage, you know, um, navigating a household and you know, where to get to the utilities and also stacking our plumbing. That, these were all things we had to think about in the, in the process of um, developing this design. And uh, so again, this is a hybrid construction. And I guess I should have mentioned that um, we were wondering what we wanted to build things out of. And to get things to know, you can either fly stuff or it's by barge. So we actually uh, decided to think about a shipping container home design um, using four 40 foot shipping containers. And with the thought behind that was, why don't we just ship all of the building materials in the shipping containers to get to know, um, you know, kind of look at that uh, cost effective way to reduce what needs to be sent there um, and making it easier and accessible to people that already live there and address some of their needs um, in the process. Next slide, please. Um, so integral features, um, again, we really had to look at what the, what the concepts could be um, you know, for different people in the home and catering to their needs. So a lot of it, was looking at age in place, you know, could this be multi-generational? Could we make it so that it's um, looking at the, the plots that we purchased, or I guess that the community had purchased? Um, what's the orientation like? Uh, which way is the wind blowing? Where's the sunlight hitting um, at, different, at different times of day and different times of year? And um, we had to really do a lot of consulting um, with our design charrette. So we reached out to Cold Climate Housing Research Center, um, some people at uh, Alaska Center for Energy and Power. We also talked with um, just different um, designers and architects. We spoke with Robin Gilchrist and um, we, we didn't really have much, much guidance as far as having a team lead and having to kind of plan out every week, <laughs> multiple times during the week, um, who we should talk to next, because we weren't the experts in any of this. We had to really reach out to people and admit that, you know, hey, we're doing this competition and we're just trying to learn. What do you think about what we're trying to do here? And some of it was, um, some of it was really challenging at times. Uh, working remotely with people that you've never met, you're really on the spot trying to get to know each other um, learning each other's communication styles and also moving forward with deadlines <laughs> in a very, very fast paced um, manner. So next slide, please. Um, so when it comes to looking at energy efficient design, um, there's this thing called the home energy rating system. And so 
when it comes to making a zero energy design, we really had to look at what what that rating system would be without um, adding more insulation, without adding PV, without having these um, energy efficient um, technologies, right? So um, that was the whole goal was to get this score as low as possible. Obviously zero would be great. We went above and beyond and got to negative three <laughs> with the help of some of the folks uh, that we consulted with. And as you can see, before we added renewables, it was it was 17. Um, and then after adding in our solar and we had a 15 kilowatt solar and battery backup system, um, so that, that really helped just bring the energy cost um, down to 240. And um, this kind of shows a really great example of what we're looking at for an average home. Um, this lighter color being the heating fuel and then the darker being the electricity. Uh, here we have no heating fuel, which is great, um, but then our, our electricity uh, cost goes down quite a bit, next slide please. And then emergency secure. So one of the things we really had to think about and went back and forth with, especially was putting in a small wood stove for emergency heat. Um, other things we really thought about um, were having a safe room and an emergency exit with a drop down ladder from a balcony. And part of that was, you know, everyone in Alaska really values, for the most part, firearms, especially for subsistence. So what are some things we can do to kind of make that more um, family friendly? And so having an emergency um, exit and a safe room, um, the emergency exit was more for fires, but um, in the case of, you know, maybe a, a, a break in or something like that, it was just, it was always thinking about the family members and um, their needs. And so this was something we really discussed and focused on. And then the backup battery system to power essential loads. Um, I think at one point we actually even called Dr. Tom Marsick and we asked about different alternate backup battery systems. And one thing that I thought uh, when I'm thinking about the things we consulted on was the idea of um, an electric vehicle uh, existing as a backup battery system. Um, it, 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 as opposed to a, a fuel generator. So it was just really interesting to think about ways that we could use different technologies together um, to create some really interesting concepts. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and the, this was kind of more of what we looked at as far as um, how we were gonna do the, the walls, um, especially with the shipping container, we really had to look at our vapor barrier. Um, one of the issues with the shipping container homes was looking at thermal bridging. So if you're going into a shipping container and anytime you make a cut, um, you're actually at risk of losing some of that heat and having to really um, consider how that's gonna impact the design overall. overall. And one of, the, one of the benefits of wanting to do a shipping container design in a rural area is we had this idea that, you know, if we're thinking about this, somebody else has got to be doing this too. And through a little digging, um, DI and I reached out to um, an architect in Nunavut, uh, Greenland area, and named Alex Cook, who uh, was, was designing a shipping container home with SIPs, which are structurally insulated panels. And that was something we had considered in our design. And he had blown in the SIPs panels for their project. And he really encouraged us, don't do SIPs, it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. And so we actually did a, a blow in insulation instead. Um, so again, as we're going through these different ideas, it really was us requiring um, to, to think about, you know, we have this idea, we think this is what we wanna do. What are other people saying about it? Um, and then from there, we also looked at our foundation. Um, we really had to address area permafrost. I myself, uh, and I forgot to speak earlier, but um, I did a little bit of soil sampling a few years ago as a field technician. So I learned a little bit about permafrost, but uh, learning about home design and permafrost in Alaska um, was kind of a learning curve for me. So I started learning about how you could insulate the ground using geotextile fabric, um, different kinds of foundations. We looked at even triadetic foundations, which are kind of like um, a steel movable foundation and really thinking about permafrost thaw and how that's impacting homes or um, rising sea levels or flooding and how that might cause the need for moving a home physically from an area. 
um, especially over the next 50 to 100 years. So really thinking about resiliency um, was important in this design. And um, uh, again, how could he make this more cost effective? I think something we can all agree in Alaska is it's really expensive to buy a home. It's really expensive to buy a home with running water. And um, so we actually created a lease to own purchasing model for, for the tribe. Again, this was just a design concept um, where they would have an agreement and um, basically rent out to own the properties. Um, we were able to actually get um, the cost down to 250 square feet. Um, so right now, as it stands in Nome, um, the average costs we found were up to about 500 square feet. So we really tried to cut that in. Um, for the overall design itself, we probably kind of fluctuated between the square footage because we also had um, a game processing room attached to the home. Um, so instead of having a garage, we wanted something where people could actually bring in their, their wild game and process it indoors. Um, and so the, the overall square footage, I think we tried to keep it about 1700 or less. Um, and again, it could be modified depending on um, the, the, I guess, the, the client's needs. Um, but it was really just looking at how could we reduce the cost overall. And if there were additional costs that needed to be cut, we could modify that square footage later on. Um, next slide, please. So again, we had to really figure out how we were going to create um, our, our designs. And so we ended up finding a software called Cedrio. And Diyla came up with this design. Um, as you can see, this is supposed to be the front door here. Um, we kind of had to really, with only having four people on the team and so much work to do, there wasn't really much room for multiple people to, and especially being remote, we didn't really have access to each contribute to working on the design concept. So the fact that one person was able to accomplish so much of this, and it turned out really great. Um, I think we went back and forth between adding an awning or a different structure, um, but a lot of it, we were just up against these deadlines and we needed to focus on um, the energy efficiency of the design. But we also kind of went with this design too because of the high winds in Nome, and we were thinking more about having the snow blow over and I think we had a, a snow wall attached to this house um, that's not visible here. But that was really what we tried to focus on where it was um, the energy efficiency and the insulation of the home overall. Next slide, please. Um, so Kiana, thank you. These were just some of the many partners on this project. Um, uh, Tyler Boys from Alaska Housing Finance Corporation, Robin Christ with University of Alaska Southeast, Mike Cruz with Arcadis, Amanda Bird at ASAP, Tom Marsick with um, the Sustainable Energy Program. Uh, Rohini Brahme was a mentor on the Solar Decathlon, and that was brought on later on. It was, it was something that wasn't exactly available to us as a mentor. I think we had another mentor at one point that was um, in Australia, <laughs> so we had a little bit of a snafu as far as trying to meet remotely. Um, to get assistance on this project and get some feedback. So it was great when Rohini stepped in just to offer some advice. Um, Jolene Lyon with Bering Strait Regional Housing Authority, Dr. Por Paul Torsellini and the NREL or National Renewable Energy Labs Building Science Education Series that we all had to complete as one of the requirements. And Idalis Yvette Reyes actually designed our team logo. And I should have mentioned that our team name was Ashravik. We had to come up with a team name and that was Inupiaq for Blueberry. And um, Alex Cook with Arctech, Michael P. Smith with Regenitech, Thorsten Kloop, or sorry, excuse me, Thorsten Kloop um, with Arctic Sun LLC, Village of Solomon, and then the rest of the Solar Decathlon organizers. Next slide, please. Um, so this was a portrait that we had done by Idalise Reyes. She's an indigenous artist, and we really wanted to focus on our community members and just highlighting that this was a project done by traditionally excluded or non-traditional students overall. And we wanted to really just represent Alaska and the indigenous um, community members here. So we were really grateful to have a lot of creativity <laughs> in a, a competition that was very science, building science and energy science heavy. Next slide, please. 
Um, and so I've actually prepared some slides um, of the competition for you all. And I wanted to go ahead and run through those, but um, I just wanted to say thank you for letting me share. Um, this was a really challenging project and it was really rewarding overall, but I've told myself that I'm glad to talk about it, but I couldn't have done it without my team members. And um, it was really a lot of people throughout Alaska and throughout the Arctic that really, and subarctic that really helped us think about designing for cold regions when it comes to housing security. So thank you. Um, <laughs> We'll take questions, um, or we can go through the pictures from the competition. Um, or are we out of time? We're out of time. That. Okay. But, uh, do you have time for questions? Yeah. Did you go on a tour of the Monroe and Park? We did. Yep. Yeah. So we actually went there for the competition, um, and um, I really want to show pictures, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Third place. Yeah, we did get third place in the new housing, and it was the, the first team from UAF for that. Meg, are you heading up the team next year? Or? No. <laughs> Talk to uh, Chandler. Yeah, okay. Talk to Chandler. He'd love to get a team together, and uh, if you guys know anybody, um, yeah, put them in his direction. Get another, get another one place. We had one this year, but as Meg said, it is a lot of work. Um, so be prepared for that. That's what actually yeah. crushed the team this year. Yeah. They realized how much there was a bunch of engineers um, that realized, wow, we don't have time to do some other things. So a lot of work. Nice work, Meg. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm going to call Casey Hamilton. Give me a suit. Give me a rack. There we go. Do you have a clicker by any chance? Nope. Okay, that's fine. I just have a lot of anime agents. That's what I'm here <laughs> for. Oh, help, us help out with cool. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have one more presentation. You guys are doing great. Stay strong. <laughs> Which, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Hamilton. I'm a graduate student at Penn State University, actually. So I'm really excited to be all the way out here. Um, and I want to thank the committee and the conference for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share about my master's thesis work, which is entitled Predicting Berry Plant Habitat Under Climate Change in Bristol Bay, Alaska. So with that, I will jump in. So just starting off with some background and motivations on the project, uh, just to give you some context. And so the first part of that is recognizing that this project was conducted within a broader project called Polaris. You've heard about it. Um, and this project is really all about um, assessing environmental risks to coastal Alaskan communities and trying to promote resilience to those uh, risks induced by climate change in particular. And so with my background in ecology and geography, um, I started looking into some of the changes across the landscape, particularly involving vegetation shifts and resource harvesting, which eventually led me into learning about wild berry plants. Next slide. Um, and so that kind of leads into the main topic of my presentation, which is species distributions. If you don't know, species distributions generally refers to the spatial arrangement of species on the landscape. And this is particularly important in the age of climate change as species distributions are really governed by uh, their physiological tolerance to climate related factors like precipitation and temperature regimes. So as the climate changes, we expect these distributions to shift in line with these shifting climatic envelopes. 
And of course, this is really important at high latitudes where we're seeing warming at about four times the rate of the global average and where we're already seeing significant biotic community reorganization. A really good example of this is what some people call the shrubification phenomenon, which generally refers to sort of woodier shrub species and tree species moving in to Arctic areas as uh, temperatures rise. So, and so with all of those shifts that are happening, some species, shrub species in particular, could be threatened. And so that kind of what is kind of what led us into uh, focusing on berry plants. And as many of you know, uh, berry plants are really important, especially to human communities as healthy economical food resources with really high rates of harvesting all across Alaska and in communities like Dillingham. Um, but these are also important to wildlife ecology, including birds, bears, rodents, and other species as well. Next, please. Um, so as it happens, we already know that climate change is impacting berry plants in a lot of ways. For example, productivity, we've seen from extreme winter warming experiments that berry production can be hampered um, by these extreme temperatures. Next, please. Um, also, phenology changes. So we're seeing earlier fruiting in warmer years, which can cause things like pollinator mismatch and also hamper the reproductive capacity of these species. Next, please. But what we found is that there was sort of less known specifically about berry plants uh, response to climate change in terms of their distribution at a landscape scale, which has implications for people's access to these resources. So that's kind of what we wanted to focus in on in this project. Next. And so that led us to these three objectives here. So first, to identify the dominant drivers of berry habitat distribution. Second, to predict current berry habitat distribution across the landscape. And third, to try to predict how that distribution might change uh, under future climate scenarios. And so to do that, we focused on five important berry species, which, which some of you might be familiar with. So uh, three sort of more generalist species, Vaccinium vitis idea, Vaccinium oliginosum, and Impetrum nigrum, and then two sort of more specialist species, Rubus chemi morris and Viburnum edgeley. So these were the five species that we focused on, and we built separate models for each of these. And with that, I will get into some of our methods. General methodological approach here we took was species distribution modeling, which I'll get into here. But starting off, just to give you an idea of where we were looking, this is the study area that we selected. Um, you can see in this map on the right, the study area was actually based on uh, boundaries of NRCS uh, survey areas, which we used because we ended up using NRCS vegetation observation data in order to sort of drive our models. So it sort of just made sense. Ended up being an area of about 47,000 square kilometers. Um, many of you are probably very familiar with this area. Um, you know, it's a diverse landscape um, and generally a subarctic climate with some maritime influence. And so, as I mentioned, we used species distribution modeling, which, if you don't know, very briefly, um, is sort of a, an approach that leverages the idea of ecological niche. So supposing that um, species distributions, again, are governed by these environmental gradients, we can then associate these observations with those environmental variables to kind of characterize that habitat niche and then extrapolate it across the landscape to predict where areas of suitable habitat might be. And so in order to build those models, we needed sort of two main buckets of data. And the first bucket is observation data. So as I mentioned, we partnered with the NRCS of Alaska in two of their uh, surveys in order to get observation data on, on these berry species. So using those data, uh, you can click next, we got 1,627 data points, and each of these data points were categorized as being either present or absent for each of our five species of interest, and that's sort of what drove our models. And then, of course, the other major piece are the environmental variables, which are our predictor variables. And we got these from a variety of open source geospatial repositories. Um, and they came in three main categories of soils, uh, climate, and uh, topography. Um, and so I won't get sort of into the specifics here, but just know that these were sort of continuous across our study area, which allowed us to extrapolate our predictions across the study area. And also for our climate variables, we got future model projections, um, which allowed us to predict change into the future. And then so to develop our models, you can click through these, um, sort of 
following uh, the procedure that I just showed you a couple slides ago, but we basically combine our environmental gradients with our observations after doing some variable selection to remove redundant variables and balancing some of our observations for some of the rarer species um, in order to build our models. Uh, our models being driven by the random forest algorithm, which is a machine learning uh, algorithm classification and regression tree approach. So that's what allowed us to sort of statistically associate our species observations with these environmental gradients. And so once we then had our uh, final models, we used them to achieve our research objectives. So the first one was to um, extract variable importance, which would tell us about the most influential drivers in our models. And then second, we uh, used our models to, again, extrapolate across the landscape to make predictions about areas that we think are suitable um, to support these species. And then we sort of plugged into our models those future climate projections that I mentioned in order to predict change in terms of the distribution of suitable habitat in the future. And then we transformed these maps into sort of binary classifications of suitable habitat versus unsuitable habitat. And that allowed us to sort of better quantify these changes um, by sort of differencing them and seeing areas uh, where we're expected to lose habitat or gain habitat uh, under future climates. So sort of the methods overview, now I will get into some results. So this is um, a slide on sort of our first objective. So looking at the most important drivers uh, in terms of environmental gradients for um, habitat distribution for these species. So there's a lot to see here, um, but sort of one main takeaway is that you can see uh, sort of the order of the variables is quite different across these species. So that sort of highlights interspecific differences in their sort of habitat preferences. Um, I also have a few animations here. So another, that's okay. <laughs> another thing uh, to point out here that elevation appeared highly for our three generalist species, which was sort of unexpected. We also saw these soil variables appearing highly for Rubus camemoris in particular, its top six were all uh, soil variables, which was sort of what we expected, um, as well as things like soil pH for Vaccinium oligonosum. And of course, we also saw our climate variables being highly important across most of our models, in particular, January temperature, July temperature, and July precipitation. And so then our second main objective was to predict the current likely habitat distribution of these species across the region. And so again, you can see these maps are uh, quite different from each other, which kind of speaks to these different habitat preferences for these species. Um, and I should say that sort of the, the darker green uh, represents sort of higher likelihood of suitable habitat for each species, whereas the tan is lower likelihood. Um, and so again, a few things to point out here. Next, please. Uh, these three generalist species you can see sort of occupy, are, are likely to occupy the vast majority of the study region, which is sort of what we would expect based on their habitat preferences. Whereas in contrast, we can see cloudberry is sort of uh, restricted to this central region, which kind of maps closely with moist and organic matter rich soils, um, which again, we sort of expect to see from cloudberry. And finally, highbush cranberry being sort of the, the rarest of the species, being mostly restricted to this area here, which is majority forested, which is again in line with what we would expect to see from that species. And so finally, our kind of third objective was to try to predict change to the distribution of suitable habitat for each of these species. So this is what this uh, array of maps is showing with each of our five species across and three different climate scenarios uh, going down. And so sort of the, the brown pixels represent uh, habitat loss, uh, whereas green pixels represent habitat gains. Um, so again, you can see quite a bit of differences between these species, which suggests that some will be more vulnerable to climate change than others. Um, and in particular, you can see uh, in future nigrum, for example, is our species that we predicted to see the most amount of loss across um, RCP scenarios. Whereas uh, other species like cloudberry um, actually show uh, a lot less loss and a lot more gains in some areas under future climates. Okay, so with that, I just have some final slides wrapping up on some of the implications of these findings. So first we saw that 
uh, are three categories of predictor variables were all highly influential across models in different ways. Um, but again, we saw that these vary by species, which kind of reflects um, the different ecologies of each of these species. And again, these were mostly consistent with our expectations, for example, seeing soil pH for blueberry and all of these soil variables for cloudberry. But we did see um, some things that were sort of unexpected, like the importance of elevation, for example, which is uh, generally considered an in in indirect variable with correlating with uh, temperature and precipitation gradients. Um, and so that likely has a really important impact on microclimates, uh, which really influences habitat distribution for these species. We also saw the importance of soil variables, which is sort of a novel finding for species distribution models um, in general, as these are kind of hard to include in these models. And by partnering with NRCS, we were able to include them at a really high spatial resolution and show that they were highly influential as well. And of course, we also saw our climate variables being really important, particularly January and July temperature, which goes to show that um, climate change is likely to have a significant impact on the spatial distribution of these species, and also could reflect the importance of temperature in, for some important life history processes for these species like germination and bud break. In terms of our uh, predictions about future change to suitable habitat distribution, we broadly saw a distribution retraction, at the very least shifts for most of these species under future climate scenarios. And this is sort of consistent with the broad literature surrounding uh, species distribution shifts with climate change that generally show reductions and movement northward in particular with climate change. But there are some limitations to this modeling approach that I wanted to make note of, um, particularly the fact that we solely based these predictions on changing climate and didn't consider things like land cover change, permafrost thaw, all these things that we know are going to happen and will create these emergent conditions that will also be highly significant in determining future uh, habitat distributions for these species. Another thing to consider is that um, sort of a method Z thing, but we quantify these differences at a probability threshold and choosing different thresholds can significantly impact the results in this way. And just an example of that is Viburnum edgeli, showing a map here in the top right, which shows its probability difference map, um, which basically is just showing that all the purple areas show a higher likelihood uh, or an increasing likelihood in future climates of it having suitable habitat in those areas but it just didn't show up in our models because we chose that probability threshold. So that's something to consider as well. And then finally, just some uh, implications for climate adaptation and management based on these findings. So again, we're predicting generally habitat loss um, for these species, which could in turn threaten people's access to these resources, or at least where they'll have to go in order to harvest them. And so hopefully we're hoping that our predictions can assist in targeted adaptation planning by showing certain areas on the landscape where species are likely to move to or need to be supported in order to um, have them accessible to people. So finally, all that being said, this is sort of just a summary slide, but again, we were able to use these models to predict change in suitable habitat area for these species under climate change which represented sort of a one of the first spatially explicit estimates of climate change impacts on berry plants at a landscape scale. And we hope that this can guide management action and targeted adaptation planning on the landscape. But it really speaks to an early warning for detrimental impacts to berry habitat in the future under future climate. Change. So that is all I have. Thank you. Can you look specifically at like the access side of things in terms of where there are trails or um, anything like that? We didn't actually. Um, we do, we had access to some harvest maps, mm -hmm. but we didn't really find a way to integrate that into the modeling approach. I think the next great step would be looking at that sort of overlaying it on our maps and seeing if there's any, you know, any crossover there. Um, but yeah, I think that would be a really great new direction to go. You said that uh, cranberries like the uh, densely wooded areas. Can you hope that cranberries like cranberries for more wooded areas? Yeah, that's my understanding. And as the permafrost leaves, you would expect more trees to come in. So why is the population going down? 
Yeah, so that's what I was sort of trying to explain on that last slide, which I know I went through really quick, but it, it's really due to the quantification procedure in which we had to convert our maps into binary classes of suitable habitat versus unsuitable habitat at a given probability threshold. And so it's really just an artifact of having to select a threshold in that way. We actually saw probability increases for that species. Um, but it just wasn't enough to pass that threshold where we could quantify it as increasing habitat. The other part is that these were based, as I said, solely on climate variables. There are ways to um, kind of include other variables like predicted land cover change, and that might help to, you know, bring in more of what we would expect to see in that way as well. Um, but yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, I did. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, totally. That would be really cool. We don't have any interactive maps like that yet, um, but sort of through the Polaris project, we're working on kind of transforming our paper into uh, like a, a community readable paper. Um, and so included in that, I think we're also planning on making these maps more widely accessible. Um, in terms of expanding the mapping, we don't have any plans for that. It, it's sort of a, a limitation based on the data set that we had, where we sort of had to restrict it to this area. Um, and, you know, extrapolating it to other areas, there might be issues in that way of, of not being, you know, totally, totally feasible. Um, but I think it would be great to be able to do this in other areas if people wanted to collect some data. So this summer I was picking berries here in Gillingham and I took a nap in the tundra and uh, when I woke up, I looked and right in front of me was a small little fly and it was being devoured by this uh, Venus trap type of plant. And it occurred to me that these little fly eating plants were everywhere and there were thousands of them. They were just really tiny and I had always overlooked them. And I was one, and then I wondered, I was curious if they were sort of interdependent species, like plants or like a microbiome, or uh, they helped other plants around them. Have you have you noticed any correlations with these types of plants? I, I don't I'm not the person to ask about that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I'm I'm sort of the mapping guy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean I, I I'm sure that. Someone, some people know about those uh, those micro communities, um, but yeah, they are a sundew, and they're very specific to their habitat, and they have mycorrhizal associations as well as that entomological connection that's driven by that habitat and the, the water regime also that's within that territory, and that is having a lot of changes. 